was young, I didn't know Montreal other than uh, when I'd come visit my mom's family in Okaganasadagi, Quebec, and listen to Shom, and I'd go back to the States, and I'd be like, oh, you gotta listen to Super Tramp. <laughs> <laughs> I had the t-shirt, and you know, and one of my friends looked at me, and he goes, oh, Super Tramp? Are you sure, Cheryl? And I went, oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> but their dad was a Huggazaste Mohawk. Um, we were born there, me and my sisters, and so, um, we, I tell people, you know, uh, my sister, she she died tragically in 1988 in Aguasasne, and it took us on um, a journey through hell, a quiet suffering that only three years ago I really started to talk about it and feel it and, and start to connect with other families and break this silence of violence that welcomes us into the world and surrounds us wherever we go. Maybe if things were different, I would be a professor here. I don't know, but I really enjoyed coming in on the, on the, on the metro and, and seeing all the beautiful faces and listening and hearing all the different dialects and the cultures. I mean, I just sat there in awe of each and every one of you and wish you well on your journey here at Concordia and to also welcome Dr. Shireen. Um, Rezek, like I'm introducing her, I was just a little res girl and now I'm introducing one of these beautiful spirits. I read her bio, I checked out Wikipedia and I went, wow, <laughs> <laughs> like bowing to you and so I won't keep you any longer, but by all means, um, you'll be seeing me, I'll be testifying publicly when the National Inquiry comes to Quebec and we have to tell this painful story. I say you have to feel before you can heal. Now go on. Thank you so much, Cheryl. <coughs> and you really have set the energy in the room because it's only now that after that she has spoken and she has cleared the discursive terrain that I can even introduce myself to you. So my name is Yasmin Giovanni and I am um, the Concordia University Research Chair in Intersectionality, Violence and Resistance. I, think. Um, I want to say a little bit about Kim. Kim was, is a hardcore feminist scholar, okay? <laughs> theorist and thinker. And she, is, she has inspired not only me, but so many uh, of her students, her colleagues, and even now in her work in the university. She is the Associate Dean of Research and Graduate Studies for the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Thank you. I'll just be a few minutes. First, I want to say that Yasmin, it's a delight to be here, and thank you for giving me a few minutes. Cheryl, you are a professor. You're welcome here, and you're a teacher, and you're a healer, you're a member of the community, and the way that you uh, speak to people is how we need to think about how we need to speak to each other in institutions like this one, Concordia. And it's so fantastic to see professors, but most of all, students who are here, because you, we talk about the next generation, you are the next generation of resistors. So I welcome all of you uh, as the Associate Dean of Research and Graduate Studies. And uh, keep the faith. It's like doing the dishes. It's never done, being uh, an activist. <laughs> Sad. Uh, is that a gendered kind of euphemism that I can spank myself for later? Maybe. And it's difficult work to do. And it's people, and, and as I often tell my students, why would people give up their own privilege? So this is where her work becomes really more than just simply work. It's work that we as activists can leverage and use. And that, to me, is really important. Because that takes the work out of the academy and into the field. Well, without saying anything more, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Shirin Razak. Thank you. It's great to be back here. I started here 27 years ago. I'm not afraid to say how long. <laughs> um, so it, 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 it's kind of a good thing, because it feels like it's kind of closing the circle a little bit. But I would just like to uh, use this opportunity to kind of reflect on what the difficulties are in trying to talk about something like missing and murdered indigenous women. So in, in July of 2017, that's this year, a Toronto city councilor withdrew a motion asking the council to establish an intersectional awareness week. 
The counselor, uh, someone I know and respect, uh, Christian Wong Tam, was herself a racialized woman, immigrant woman of the LGBTQ community. And she explained that she really wanted to build allyship. And she stressed, uh, she wanted to stress that we're not a one issue people. But she withdrew her motion after hearing complaints from black scholars and activists who felt that the motion came at the expense of the city's commitment to more substantive work on the urgent issues that affect black communities. So Wong Tan said uh, that she understood their skepticism in light of police shootings of black men <coughs> in Toronto that summer and every summer. And I, you know, it was quite easy to imagine from afar, since I'm now in Los Angeles, watching these things unfold in the Canadian context, it was quite easy to imagine what those black scholars and activists, some of whom I knew, uh, were actually feeling. They, they would have heard this motion to have an intersectionality awareness week in a similar way, I'm guessing as uh, we all heard the kind of racist response to Black Lives Matter uh, was All Lives Matter. And you know we knew right away what was wrong with that, because all lives don't matter in the same way, to, certainly to the police. Uh, I think the Toronto incident highlighted a really um, a common risk that we take when we adopt the notion of intersectionality. And that is that it, it, it is liable to condense very complex social issues into a simpler analytic that is attractive to those seeking liberal solutions. I like the word diversity, intersectionality, absolutely through no fault of the people who develop this idea or who use it, not their fault. But intersectionality and diversity can sort of be taken to mean something like, all we have to do is bring all the factors into play and perhaps bring everybody to the table, people who are left out, and all would be well. And because it is amenable to such condensation, intersectionality functions like diversity regardless of what advocates intend at different times. Sometimes arguing we should pay more attention to the specific histories of settler colonialism, Sometimes saying, let's throw it out. Sometimes revising it. Sometimes saying, you know, I like Patricia Hill Collins's interlocking oppression. I don't like intersectionality. I've been there. Everybody in this room that I know has been there, actually. <coughs> what is so hard to theorize and, and attend to politically about missing and murdered indigenous women? It's been very difficult to keep a specific focus on what white men do to indigenous women. That's one of the it's not the only focus, but that one has been really difficult to hold on to. And on how the state both requires and maintains violence against indigenous women, how it participates, is an active participant in the annihilation of indig indigenous women. When intersectionality uh, first circulated, and this is a history that is covered in, in, in many texts, when it first circulated in the early 90s, it was entirely in the context of responding to the problem of the universal woman. Feminism operated with an idea of a universal woman to whom all the same things happen. Our response to that politically has always been to try to complicate it. That's where inter intersectionality be began. And you know, one of those aha moments came actually with Patricia Hill Collins herself when she wrote that you know, in <coughs> pornography, all women are objectified, but black women are animalized. And Nash you know, also makes the point, which I think is important, that if we restrict our, our attention to how race and gender and class and so on operate, then there's all kinds of other feminist scholarship that has difficulty making it into the frame, scholarship on love, desire, eroticism, pleasure, mourning, grief, etc. Intersectionality is not about variety or how these various things come together. It is really looking at uh, what, is, what is the operating factor here? Is it blackness and what is its history? I would call myself, I don't, I, you know, early on I, I, I sort of did some nitpicking around the term intersectionality because I didn't like it. Um, I, 
I, uh, because it seemed to be like it was the crossroads thing, you know, discrete systems crossing, and I didn't like that. I wanted to see how systems were each other. And I tried to use interlocking oppression, but I, you know, in the end, I really, honestly, I would call myself an intersectionality theorist of some kind, but like everybody else who uses that term, I was always really worried that intersectionality would kind of degenerate into uh, diversity. Something about that structural violence that eluded me, and that it's, it, it's taking a long time to think about. And that all changed with the murder of Pamela George, a Cree Soto woman who was murdered by two white college basketball players in 1998. Wondered if her killers got off merely because it was assumed, well, they didn't get off, they got some punishment, but not much, merely because it was assumed that prostitution was a high-risk endeavor. I didn't think that was the whole story, and I wondered what did race and colonialism have to do with what happened. So I analyzed the trial of Pamela George's killers. And when I uh, wrote of this, this murder, the, an, another murder sort of came to mind, which is the murder of Helen Betty Osborne, an indigenous schoolgirl who was gang raped and murdered by a white man in the Pa, Manitoba, a murder that an entire town knew about and kept silent for 20 years. There is the knowledge that there is a widespread phenomenon of white men sexually <coughs> brutalizing and murdering indigenous women is still only whispered and not said aloud. Instead, the pauses <coughs> and silences of the public debate are filled with another kind of violence, the violence that indigenous men do to indigenous women. It's very hard to say out loud and to say on the record what white men do to indigenous women and just how much sexual violence it takes to keep a colonial system running. And the commissioners of the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry, Hamilton and Sinclair, actually said, I'm going to read you the quote, because I think it is a shining moment in a history that does not have many shining moments. It is clear that Betty Osborne would not have been killed if she had not been Aboriginal. I actually keep those words really up close to me if she had not been Aboriginal. I think those are terribly, terribly important It's words. It's important to read this unique statement, not as a pronouncement that terrible things don't happen to non-Indigenous women. Instead, we should retrieve its substance. To Helen Betty Osborne's killers, it is her indigeneity that mattered most. Pamela George's killers knew themselves as entitled to her body. White, middle-class college students from the white suburb, the beneficiaries of all that had impoverished Pamela George's community. These two men, nevertheless, found it necessary to leave the spaces of their white middle-class homes and classrooms and to go downtown to seek out what they and their friends, even at the trial, called an Indian hooker. White. This kind of colonial self-making and power is systematized. It is authorized when a court of law determines that the two men were just boys out on an alcoholic spree. You notice how alcohol exonerates white men but criminalizes indigenous people. That's always a key move. It is there when a judge declared that Pamela George knew the risks of her job. We go through it, we take a risk when we call prostitution just a job. It is part of the system when police spent their time looking for an indigenous killer instead of a white one, never quite believing that two white college students were the murderer. It is there when the families and girlfriends cover up the murder, their friends not worried, not at all disturbed by the killing of an indigenous woman, more disturbed by the prospect that an Indian hooker had infected the two men and by extension, their girlfriends. Today, I would more confidently name the violence directed at women such as Pamela George and Helen Betty Osborne as colonial terror. Of course, law participates in terror through the creation of legal gray zones 
anomalous zones in which terror is permitted. And it's certainly <coughs> critical to understand indigenous women's vulnerability to violence, but such an emphasis obscures that indigenous women are targets. And that is a different statement. The indigenous female is seen as licentious, sexually available, imbued with sexual sin. The marking of the sexually licentious indigenous woman is intimately tied to dispossession. Bodies are literally left in places where garbage is dumped. There's a cartography that emphasizes disposability. Victims live and work in areas where there are very few services, including lighting and proper transportation. And if their bodies are found at all, they are found in empty lots and arranged to emphasize that they're garbage to be disposed of. Subjects who are considered to be dying from their own incapacity to thrive and not from state violence. And of course, it only makes sense to take the lands of those who are disappearing. Let me conclude by saying that intersectionality, a framework that emphasizes how systems of domination come into operation through each other, can get us to missing and murdered indigenous women. But it can only do so if we think about the very specific mechanics of settler colonialism. We don't want to talk out loud about what happens to indigenous women on a daily basis. And most of all, we don't want to acknowledge that this violence is terror, whether we call it intersectionality or another analytic. We should keep an eye out for our investments in the explanations we offer. Thanks.